Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's webinar, uh, Can We Drive IPM Forwards with BYDV Resistance? Hopefully you're all sat comfortably, you've got something to drink um, and probably something to eat. As I'm sure you're all aware, the, the way we are running our events has very much changed this summer um, due to all the reasons that I'm sure you're aware of, um, but our technical information is coming across on webinars now. So to kick off this evening, I'm Rose Ryby and I'm part of the KEM, KEM team based in the northeast here. Um, thank you very much, Christine. If you want to move on, we will get started and set the scene with, with the usual housekeeping. You are all on mute this evening um, and the only faces you can see on the picture tonight are ours. Um, so if any of you are laid out flat on the kitchen floor, we won't know anything about it. Questions, as always, very welcome. Um, please feed into the chat box on the right hand side. These will be then picked up and collated um, and we will look at them all at, at the end of this presentation. Um, we are aiming to finish at eight o'clock this evening, uh, I'm sure, as always. And um, my usual technical skills with timing, it may go slightly over, but we are aiming to, to finish at eight o'clock. And if you're on Twitter, um, good plug for the Monitor Farm programme, hashtag Monitor Farm. Please do follow us at AHDB underscore serials. Um, and then there's also Tom and Tom there too. This session will be recorded um, like all of our webinars. It will be sent out to you. Um, everybody that's registered will get a copy of this on, on email, but otherwise they are available on the YouTube channel or our website, ahdb forward slash webinars. So if you miss anything or want to listen again, then um, please, please do click on the link. If you could move slides, Christian. Um, there's also basis and Neuroso points available this evening. Uh, if you, again, in the chat box, could put your name, postcode, date of birth and membership number for either basis or Neuroso, and we will collate those and um, send the forms away as usual. So, like I say, in the chat box on, on the right hand side, the same place where you would put, put your questions. Um, I just also like to thank, and I always forget, but Christian is lurking in the background this evening um, and anything that goes wrong, he will bail us out. Um, so if our computers shut down or presentations disappear, then um, Christian will make sure that things keep rolling. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, Adrian Joint, who is a previous monitor farmer, is going to kick us off this evening. Um, why BVD is a threat to his his business, and then Tom Pope's going to follow up from him. Tom um, is a reader of entomology at Harper Adams University, and then Tom Dummett. Too many Toms. I'm sure I'll get you muddled up at some point. Who is a cereals and oil seeds product manager at RAGT is is going to follow in after him. So, like I say, you know, it's an informal evening. Ask your questions. Um, these people are here um, for your information, and there's lots to be found out and, and lots of discussion to be had. I'm I'm sure. So. Without further ado, hopefully I haven't missed anything um, to kick us off. I'm going to pass over to Adrian, who's going to talk a little bit further about his farm management and financial implications uh, in an effort to highlight how serious BYDV is for him. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank, thank you, Rose. Uh, if we can move on to the first slide. Um, I was monitor farmer from 2016 to 2019. So I've had a year's rest and uh, now I've, I've come back into the fold again tonight. Farm manager near British North in Shropshire, which for those of you who don't know the area, is sort of southeast of Shropshire. Um, farming just over a thousand hectares with 650 hectares of arable cropping. Um, wheat, barley, rape, oats, combinables mainly with a little bit of grain rented out for potatoes. Min till is our preferred cultivation policy. Um, but we do plow when necessary. Could we next slide, please? Th this is the um, factors and the risks, really, as, as I see it with BYDV. 
we all know that the, the winters and the autumns are getting milder. We certainly all feel that they're getting wetter, um, certainly after last year. Min till, you know, there is a, an issue perhaps with grass weeds in min till, so it has to change, your management has to change a little bit. We know that the chemical toolbox is getting smaller every year. And so we've got to look at other ways of controlling, not just B BYDV, but plenty of other pests as well. Um, and we have tools to do it. You know, we do have drilling dates which we can manage, weather permitting. Um, and we'll maybe touch on that again in a minute. Um, you know, there are some pluses in a way. We've moved away from earlier drilling uh, because of BYDV to try and reduce the threat of that. So at the same time, you know, to us, particularly in the West, it, it's reducing our pressure on Septoria as well. So there are a few positives, um, but maybe not that many. Can we have the next slide, please? This hopefully um, under the yield bit, you know, unfortunately we experienced quite a bad um, problem with, with BYDV back in 2016. We had uh, some second weeks all drilled at the same time, early September, uh, early October, that were one field got too wet to spray any insecticide on. We knew there was aphids there. The, the rest of the block we did manage to spray, and you know the yield difference was 2.3 ton a hectare. And really, perhaps that was just a message to say we've got to try and get it right. Later drilling is an option um, on some land. Most of our land, in, in, in fairness, would be suitable for later drilling. But we know from our own records that if we can drill between the middle of September to the end of September, our yields will be half a ton higher than it would be from drilling in the first three weeks of October. So we've got to factor that in. And, and, and if you just sort of take that further forward, we normally reckon to drill 100, 120 hectares of wheat a week. Um, if we delay drilling by a week in September, that's going to cost us £9,000 in yield if we put wheat in at £150. Yes, there's a bit of a saving on fungicide um, with probably £10 a hectare less <clears throat> for, the autumn, for the October sown crops as we are for September. But if we get a year like we've just had and we have to ditch the min till and hook up to the plowing combination, it's probably going to cost us another £40 a hectare, as well as all the, um, you know, the time delays where we can only drill probably 60% of the area in a day with a combination as to what we would offer the min till. So, you know, big problem. Um, and one we've got to just get our heads around a bit more going forward. Last year was not the, first, the best year to have lost deter and delay drilling. And the big conundrum this year is, do we start drilling earlier and take the threat of BYDV um, as acceptable just to get the crops in the ground before the weather breaks? Or do we adopt the same, same strategy and say, well, you know, hopefully the weather will be all right this time. Uh, on the environmental side, um, we do spray insecticides. It is done very much as a, as a last resort, not just on cereals, but also on oilseed rape. I'm a big believer that we get far more control of pests from beneficial insects than ever we do with anything out of a can. And you know, I think we need to do as much as we can to, to preserve the beneficials. Uh, can we move to the next slide? So, what are we doing at the moment here at, um, at Goulburn Farms? Well, we have delayed drilling. We don't drill as much in September, and we will probably not start drilling before about the 22nd, 23rd of September again this year. Um, you know, we've, we've had plenty of rain in the last 12 months. We're hoping there's not that much left up there. So, we'll get a decent autumn. Constantly monitoring crops. Um, for aphids and alongside that you know there's various management tools out there now um, certainly the AHDB have got one and various chemical companies have got one to give you the you know the optimum time really for, for spraying with insecticides 
uh, if we're going to use them, then we need to make the most of them and use them at the, at the appropriate time. For me, they're not just you know a blanket insurance. And um, you know, one of the worst things about them, in some ways, is that they're not expensive. If they're expensive, we use them much more carefully. But again, you know, resistance is creeping in. Cultivation-wise, we probably need to, or we will certainly be focusing on going through a roundup into the stubbles earlier, if we can, to um, take out the green bridge. It's very easy to say that, but you know, we're sat here now. We have still got um, probably 150 acres of spring barley, which will be followed by wheat. Well, how can we control the? How can we get a six-week gap now between spraying off the volunteers? and uh, planting the wheat without going very, very late. We are um, you know, constantly looking at new developments uh, in, in our options, really, and the seed variety choice going forward is probably being the, not the silver bullet, but certainly the, probably the, the best tool in the toolbox at the moment. Um, with resistant and tolerant varieties, we've got some in, in winter barley, and uh, you know we are trying a little bit of, a, of of this new variety of wheat this year. We've managed to get some seed, and it'll be interesting just to see how we fare with it. So really, uh, that's in a nutshell. That's that's what we're doing to try and control um, the risk of BYDV. It's always going to be out there, and I think there's no one thing which is going to solve the problem or help you manage the problem. It is a, a multitude of things that you've got to put together to to deal with it. And uh, you know, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Tom. Um, that's a really good start to this webinar and, and the farming impact. I don't think I could have summarised it much better myself. In that, it's it's going to be a toolbox of many things um, to to look at. So. My next speaker this evening is Tom Pope, uh, who I've said already is a reader of entomology at Harper Adams University. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, Tom. Tom's just going to chat through um, through the next 15 or so minutes um, a little bit more detail of, of what BYDV is and why it's a problem um, and, and what it IPM is and the approaches and techniques that they're looking at going forward. Thank you very much, Tom. Great. Thanks, thanks, Rose. Uh, so, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, in this uh, uh, section, I'm, I'm going to really take a bit of a step back and consider what BYDV is, the damage that it can cause, although uh, Adrian has very nicely illustrated um, the challenge posed by uh, BYDV, particularly now where we've lost a number of uh, uh, controls that we've uh, relied on over recent years. And then I'm going to introduce a, a new HDB funded project uh, and, uh, and give you an overview. This project hasn't started yet, but give you an overview of what we're uh, intending to achieve in that project. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. So Adrian's already described very well the, the, uh, the importance of BY, BYDV and the, uh, uh, the economic impact of this uh, disease if we don't get the management right. So, as I'm sure you're all very aware, BYDV is uh, a widespread, in fact, it's the most widespread of the, uh, the plant viruses and, and clearly has a, a severe economic uh, impact uh, on, on the crops um, that we're growing. We're familiar with the symptoms of BYDV, um, the, uh, illustrated in the photograph um, here, but that um, uh, chlorotic, uh, often reddening towards the tips of the leaves, stunted plants, uh, reduced uh, tolerance uh, to stress in those plants that have been uh, infected by, uh, by the virus. The problem is that by the time we see these uh, symptoms, there's nothing we can do to uh, prevent uh, the yield loss that we're going to incur. So really the, the challenge is to manage um, the, uh, the, the vectors of the uh, BYDV, or as we're going to hear later uh, this evening, uh, to consider uh, growing one of the uh, tolerant or resistant varieties to, uh, to overcome uh, BYDV. Uh, losses. So crops are, are susceptible up to growth stage um, 31. So it's early in the uh, crops establishment that we're trying to uh, prevent um, infection with um, uh, BYDV. In fact, if the crop is infected with BYDV uh, very early in the crop's growth, that can kill the plant. 
Once we get beyond growth stage 31, however, the plants take on something called mature plant resistance, where even if the plants are infected with BYDV, the yield impact is going to be negligible. So uh, the plants can, to some extent, look after themselves beyond this growth stage. So AHDB have made some estimates, and I think uh, Adrian had some of these figures in, in, on his slides, but uh, uh, yield losses on average in wheat, looking at 8%, uh, uh, due to BYDV, but this can vary widely and we can see losses anything up to 60% uh, for wheat. And we see similar, if not more severe losses in barley. So very significant losses uh, may be experienced if we don't get the management right. And when we think about how uh, we're going to manage BYDV going forward, and as Adrian uh, commented, we really need a, a, a combined approach, an integrated approach to uh, the management of this disease. Without effective controls, uh, again, if we think about wheat as an example, we're looking at uh, uh, average losses per year of 136 million pounds uh, for uh, wheat. Uh, so a really big impact on, on the industry. So something that we, we need to get right. Uh, next slide, please. So if we're thinking about uh, uh, BYDV, uh, the first thing to say, and, and Tom in the next section will say more about this, but we, we tend to use BYDV as a bit of a catch-all term, um, but actually BYDV, there are different strains of uh, BYDV that we may uh, find. And in fact, we also uh, find um, CYDV, um, uh, which is a very similar uh, disease with similar symptoms. Uh, and often we refer to both as uh, BYDV or perhaps more uh, correctly, we should refer to it as barley yellow dwarf disease because of the number of different viruses that may contribute to the similar symptoms that we see. But here in the UK, BYDV uh, PAV is the most uh, important of the, the viruses that we may encounter. And this, this virus is transmitted mainly by the bird cherry oat aphid and the English grain aphid. And we can see photographs of these two uh, virus vectors on the right hand side of this slide. Now, management um, of, um, uh, of BYDV, as I've already mentioned, and uh, Adrian uh, also commented on, has for many years relied on uh, seed treatments, the neonicotinoid um, seed treatment, particularly uh, the product deter. That, of course, is uh, no longer available. Uh, where deter uh, was very useful was because it gave you six to eight weeks of protection early in that crop's establishment. So it got us a good way through that period towards growth stage 31 when the, the, the crop is not going to be uh, susceptible to BYDV infection. In situations where we had deter, where the, uh, we still had uh, uh, aphid pressure and the uh, uh, deter was uh, running out of steam, we could consider a foliar application of a pyrethroid. Uh, and again, as Adrian uh, mentioned, um, we're now seeing uh, a resistance coming into uh, populations of the uh, English grain aphid. And uh, uh, in Ireland, we're seeing tolerance in the bird cherry oat aphid to pyrethroid insecticides. The simple truth is that we've been using pyrethroid insecticides and, and, and often relying on pyrethroid insecticides for a long period of time. And we're seeing resistance cropping up uh, in a number of um, uh, important crop pests, such as uh, these two BYDV uh, vectors. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so we clearly need a, a, an integrated approach. We, um, we've lost the neonicotinoid um, seed treatments. We have resistance developing to the pyrethroid insecticides. So if we think about uh, an integrated uh, approach to the management of um, BYDV, we need to think about the options we have to prevent them from being a pest problem. If we're concerned that there might be a pest problem, or what, what options do we have to detect that uh, pest problem? And, uh, and where we, uh, we believe that we've detected a pest problem, what can we do to control that pest problem? So if we think about the options to begin with that we can, uh, we can use to uh, uh, prevent there from being a BYDV problem, Adrian's already mentioned the, uh, the challenges with uh, delayed drilling. So this can be really effective if we delay drilling uh, to a time when there are fewer aphids flying, this can be uh, a very effective way of managing uh, BYDV. As Adrian's described, this, this in, in itself can lead to a number of challenges, uh, whether dependent, whether we can uh, delay drilling uh, effectively, given some of the uh, uh, weather patterns we've been experiencing over recent years. And indeed, the weather patterns we've been experiencing over recent years 
is one of the, the challenges of the BUIDD. As we have uh, a warming climate, it's likely that aphids are going to remain active for longer uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the autumn and early winter. Uh, creating potentially more of a BYDV pressure. So that's something we need to be aware of. But where we can, delay drilling is an effective tool uh, that we can consider. Uh, good hygiene, uh, and by good hygiene, I mean uh, preventing green bridges. So where we've got certain grass uh, weeds, as well as volunteer cereals and maize, uh, this can uh, uh, harbor BYDV. Aphids flying into uh, crops may uh, pick up the BYDV virus from these uh, uh, from these uh, points of inoculum and then move that virus into the crop. So wherever possible, if we can remove those um, sources of inoculum, uh, that's a good option uh, to consider. Adrian commented about um, uh, the use of minimum or zero uh, tillage as being a, a useful uh, tool in the management of BYDV, albeit it may in itself lead to uh, weed problems, grass weed problems. That's something that we need to think about. But it has been reported that the, the careful selection of cultivation, such as uh, zero or min till, is one way that we can reduce um, BYDV pressure. And then, of course, the, uh, perhaps the most interesting uh, innovation over the last uh, uh, couple of years has been uh, the, uh, the emergence of, uh, of a number of varieties, um, uh, barley varieties that are tolerant to uh, BYDV, uh, KWS Amistar and LG Seeds Raffaella. And then, of course, we have the BYDV resistant wheat, um, REGT Wolverine, that Tom's going to talk about in a few moments. It's worth just making the point, and I'm sure Tom will, will pick up on this, the difference between tolerance and, and uh, resistance is that in a tolerant variety, they get infected with BYDV in just the same way as a susceptible variety, but they're able to produce a, a, a viable yield despite being infected. Whereas in uh, the uh, uh, resistant variety, the virus isn't able to multiply in the way that it would do in a, uh, in a susceptible variety. Uh, next slide, please. So the next stage of our IPM uh, program or the consideration of our uh, IPM program, we've prevented there being a BYDV problem where we can. Now we need to detect whether we, uh, we're encountering a, a BYDV threat. So there's a couple of options that we can consider here. We can uh, use um, uh, one of the tools um, available through AHDB, the AHDB AFID News, which uh, uh, exploits the um, uh, the Rothamsted uh, insect survey with the suction traps um, dotted around the country and very usefully gives a, a, an early warning of when aphids are migrating and indicates when we should be uh, inspecting crops to see whether we have um, uh, uh, BYDV vectors moving into establishing uh, cereal crops. So that leads on to the next uh, uh, stage of our uh, detect uh, for, of our B, uh, IPM program in-field monitoring of BYDV vectors. So uh, most head, uh, aphids are found towards um, the headlands. So this, this comes out of some research uh, recently completed, some HDB funded research by uh, Game Wildlife Conservation Trust and Agri, who used um, sticky yellow traps uh, to monitor for aphids uh, moving into uh, cereal crops. And they found far more aphids uh, towards the uh, headlands than in the centre of uh, the crop, which uh, when you think about uh, aphids being very weak flyers, as they uh, move over um, uh, field boundaries, they benefit from the uh, uh, being in the lee of the wind. Uh, this enables the uh, aphids to, uh, to leave the airstream and to, um, to land on, on the, uh, the young cereal plants. But they're best able to do this in those more sheltered areas uh, close to the uh, headlands. Uh, of the uh, of the field, so we can use um, sticky traps. We can also inspect the crop. Uh, again, um, uh, GWCT and and Agri found that uh, the yellow sticky traps were actually a more effective way of monitoring for BYDV vectors than uh, simply inspecting the crop. The challenge of using uh, the simple yellow sticky traps, and you notice that the yellow sticky traps to be most effective are held horizontally rather than vertically. Uh, on these canes uh, that seems to work better um, to have the, uh, the traps uh, set up in this horizontal uh, position like this. But the challenge is really to identify uh, the aphids stuck to the, uh, the yellow sticky trap. 
we'll find uh, many aphids on the yellow sticky trap, but only some of them will be uh, bird cherry oat aphids and some of them will be uh, grain aphids. And we really need to be able to quickly, accurately and reliably identify which are the BYDV vectors on our yellow sticky trap and which are the, uh, uh, the other species of aphid and indeed other insects that we find stuck to the yellow sticky trap. Lots of insects like the colour yellow, so it's not really a very discriminating um, uh, type of trap to use. So we need uh, uh, a good way of identifying the BYDV vectors on these uh, traps, but they present a, a potentially a uh, useful tool uh, for we, we might wish to consider. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Okay, so um, uh, we have a number of options then to consider um, uh, controlling um, uh, our pest uh, pest problem. Uh, we we have a, a long-standing um, threshold of five to ten. Uh, aphids per uh, per hundred plants that uh, uh, has been a, a long-standing threshold which we uh, if we exceed um, a pyrethroid application would be uh, would be justified uh, in most cases I believe uh, we don't um, uh, uh, we don't use the uh, this particular threshold what seems to be much more um, uh, widely used is the use of uh, the AHDB BYDB management tool and indeed a number of other um, organizations have um, developed their own BYDB management tool. These tools are based on the T-sum calculation which allows us to time uh, the pyrethroid application in order to control the second generation of aphids. If we think about the uh, winged aphids flying into the establishing cereal crop only a small proportion of those aphids will be carrying BYDV, perhaps only around 5 to 15, maybe 20% of those aphids will be carrying the BYDV virus. And so these aphids will land on a, a small number of plants in, in the crop. And what we're trying to do with managing the second uh, generation of aphids is stopping those aphids from moving out from these uh, point sources of BYDV infection within the crop and spreading the disease throughout uh, more widely throughout the crop. So we're looking at using these BYDV management tools to stop this spread uh, of the, the virus within, uh, within the crop. Whichever uh, threshold or management uh, uh, tool we're using, we do come down to the, uh, the uh, only chemical control that we have of the pyrethroid insecticide uh, insecticides where we do have um, resistance issues uh, in the grain aphid and appears to be developing resistance issues in the bird cherry oat aphid and as Adrian commented any application of a pyrethroid insecticide ne needs to be carefully considered because it will have a detrimental impact on natural enemies. So I'm just curious and um, uh, maybe as a, a poll that we could um, we could run tonight just how um, how many people are considering using uh, of the threshold of five to ten aphids per hundred plants uh, versus the um, AHDB or another uh, version of the BYDB management tool based on the T-sum uh, calculation. Christian, are you able to put up that poll? Yep. Is this the first poll? Sorry, or is this a, a later the, one? No, I've, I've jumped on. This is the third. The third poll. Third poll. How do you time parathot? Yep. I'll launch it now. So we've got the um, the, the three options there. So. Uh, as is often the case, um, are, are we applying pyrethroids when we see a, first see aphids within the crop? Are we applying pyrethroids um, when we're using a, a threshold of five to ten aphids per hundred plants? Or are we using a, a, a pyrethroid application to prevent the second generation of aphids uh, from spreading BYDV within the crop using a T-sum calculator such as the AHDB uh, BYDV uh, management tool? I'll just give another five, ten seconds or so. We're getting quite a few yeah. more votes still trickling in. Excellent. Perfect. That's quite a good number now. Right. I'll close it now. Brilliant. Thanks, Christian. Excellent. So that's really interesting. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for taking part in that poll. It's really uh, interesting, and and I think a really good uh, a good news story there that uh, people are accessing the um, uh, these AHD well the uh, BYDD management tools such as the HDB 
uh, version of this TSUM um, calculator. It's really that second generation where we're going to get the biggest uh, uh, benefit. And, uh, and when we're thinking about uh, insecticide applications as being a, a really precious resource, and we're trying to, to manage for uh, resistance, to avoid uh, further resistance developing, but, uh, but this is a really good way in, in uh, uh, preserving the, um, the effectiveness of that group of insecticides. Great, uh, next slide please, Christian. So this brings me on to the, uh, uh, the new um, project I'd just like to introduce this evening. We were trying to find novel solutions to improve the management of uh, BYDV um, vectors. So as Tom's going to talk about in the next, um, the next section, we, we're starting to see resistance, uh, resistant um, varieties to uh, BYDV. But the important point to make here is that that's resistance to the BYDV virus, not to the aphid vectors. So you will still see aphids feeding on um, uh, wolverine, the, the resistant wheat variety, as you will on the tolerant uh, barley varieties. So the variety is resistant or tolerant to the virus, but not to the aphids. So there's been lots of work looking at um, uh, breeding for resistance in cereals to the BYDV vectors, but that, as it stands, none of the um, uh, None of these uh, forms of resistance have made it into commercially available um, varieties. What we wondered when we're thinking about uh, uh, developing a novel uh, approach to BYDV management was that we haven't found uh, good um, uh, forms of resistance, but um, could we turn that on its head and look for um, high levels of susceptibility uh, to BYDV vectors? And I have to be careful how I, uh, I comment on this third point, but in talking to uh, some of my, let's say, more mature members of staff at Harper Adams University, uh, they actually began their careers working on a variety of uh, winter wheat called Maris Huntsman, which was widely grown uh, back in the 1970s and 80s. And in fact, it's still grown by just a few growers um, because uh, Maris Huntsman is still used today uh, for thatching. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the, the interest in Maris Huntsman is that um, Maris Huntsman was grown in the 1970s and 80s at a time where we had uh, really severe outbreaks of aphid, uh, aphid pests. When Maris Huntsman uh, started to be replaced by more modern semi-dwarf varieties, these uh, severe outbreaks of, uh, uh, of uh, aphids uh, disappeared. Now, talking to my colleagues, uh, the work done at that time um, clearly indicated that Maris Huntsman was a highly susceptible uh, variety to uh, uh, aphid to, uh, in cereals and particularly uh, BYDV vectors. And so we're looking to see whether that link between Maris Huntsman being a highly susceptible um, variety, whether we can exploit this susceptibility within an IPM program. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, before we got to the, the project, we wanted to, uh, to understand just how susceptible uh, Maris Huntsman is. Obviously, Maris Huntsman was grown, um, well, 40 years or so ago. Uh, so how does it actually stack up in terms of um, its susceptibility to modern uh, recommended list uh, varieties? So a piece of work done at, at Harper Adams by one of our students, Dan Halls, um, a couple of years ago, was to take Maris Huntsman and compare its susceptibility to um, a range of recommended list varieties. So what you can see here is a circle of, um, uh, of pots and in, in those pots we've got either a recommended list variety or Maris Huntsman or one or two other uh, ancient or old varieties that we were interested in in this particular study. The pot you can see in the centre of the circle contains a number of tubes and those tubes are full of uh, winged grain aphids uh, that uh, leave those tubes and then they're free to land on whichever plant they, they wish to do so. By re-randomizing the position of those plants, uh, replacing the plants with fresh plants, re-randomizing their position and repeating this uh, uh, experiment uh, a number of times, we start to get a picture as to which of the plants, or which of the varieties rather, uh, the, uh, the uh, aphids prefer to land on. Uh, next slide, please. And what we find is, is a very striking uh, result. The, the large um, uh, blue bar on the right-hand side of the graph is the Maris Huntsman um, bar. And what we find is that uh, 
uh, up to 20 times more winged aphids landed on the Maris Huntsman than did on a number of the AHDB recommended list varieties, which are shown in the, uh, the orangey colour. The other blue um, uh, bar uh, represents uh, another old variety called Flanders that was um, uh, grown at a similar time to, to Maris Huntsman, as you can see, is also a, a preferred uh, uh, variety for aphids to land on. Interestingly, because I think there's a perception that uh, as we've bred for higher yields and higher quality, we've made plants um, more and more susceptible to, uh, to various um, pests and diseases. Well, the, the three green bars uh, represent ancient wheats, uh, emma, einkorn and spelt. And you can see that actually these um, ancient wheats are, are, are slightly preferred compared with uh, recommended list varieties in terms of plants on which the aphids want to land on. So Maris Huntsman appears to be, compared with recommended list varieties, a much preferred um, variety for uh, the grain aphid uh, to land on. Interestingly though, once they land on the Maris Huntsman, the populations don't build up any quicker on the Maris Huntsman uh, than they do on a modern recommended list varieties. It appears to be that the susceptibility is to do with um, the landing behaviour of the aphids rather than that Maris Huntsman in some way uh, supports higher numbers of aphids and that the aphids do better on Maris Huntsman. They simply seem to like to land on Maris Huntsman uh, as opposed to other uh, wheat varieties. Uh, next, next slide please. So with this information uh, of the uh, apparent susceptibility of Maris Huntsman, uh, this uh, uh, led to uh, this new AHDB funded uh, PhD project, which is uh, starting later this, this month. And the, the project really has two key areas that we're, we're looking to focus on. If we think about our uh, IPM program, and we're thinking about our options to uh, prevent, detect uh, and control uh, a pest, where we think this project could be useful is in providing another tool with which we can prevent there from being a pest problem. If we think about the, uh, the, um, the GWCT Agri project where they found that most aphids flying into a crop um, land close to the headland, well, this uh, presents the opportunity to grow a trap crop to intercept the aphids as they fly into the crop, preventing the aphids moving in then into the, uh, the, main, uh, the main crop. If we have that uh, trap crop close to the headland, close to our flowering strips where we have the highest numbers of natural enemies, we have the potential here to have a, a win-win where we're putting uh, the aphid BYDV vectors close to the highest populations of our natural enemies. So that's one part of this project. The, the second part of the project is if we can understand the chemical basis for why uh, uh, the grain aphid, at least probably the, um, uh, the bird chariot aphid, why they prefer to land on Maris Huntsman as opposed to uh, another variety of wheat. This is likely to be due to the uh, smell or the odour of the Maris Huntsman compared to those other uh, varieties. So if we could um, get a, a better handle on that, we can improve in-field monitoring tools. And I see here I'm running horrendously over time, so I'll just wrap up the last few slides uh, nice and nice and quickly. Uh, next slide please, uh, Christian. So this work um, will investigate the landing behaviour of the uh, bird chariot aphid, to see if that's the same as the uh, English grain aphid. And then we're going to use this device uh, that you can see the, uh, the illustration of called an olfactometer to confirm that the aphids are actually responding to the odour of the Maris Huntsman, not just its visual appearance. Next slide please, Christian. We're going to test out this uh, idea of um, uh, having a trap crop around the main, uh, the main wheat crop to see if we can trap out the uh, aphids flying into uh, the wheat crop and to see if we also get higher numbers of natural enemies within these, uh, within these uh, trap crops. Uh, next, next slide please Christian. And because aphids can't tell us what they can smell and I hope nobody's squeamish here, we can hook an aphid up to an electrical circuit and we can uh, present different smells from the Maris Huntsman across the aphid and we can get an electrical uh, response of the aphid uh, to those uh, different odours and that would tell us which chemicals we should be adding to our, uh, to our monitoring tool. Next slide please Christian. So if we can identify these chemicals that the aphids respond well to 
we can uh, develop, uh, look to develop a, uh, a infield monitoring tool that is um, uh, more selective, but more reliable and more sensitive to BYDV vectors uh, going forward. So hopefully a tool that will complement existing uh, BYDV management options. So hopefully that gives you an idea about this uh, this forthcoming uh, AHDB project. Uh, if anybody's uh, interested in, in this project and would like to know more, please feel free to contact me. Um, my, my contact details are at the bottom there. Uh, Rose has already given my uh, Twitter handle, which uh, you're very welcome to uh, to contact me on as well. And we'll, we'll publish the results, obviously, through the AHDB route. But wherever possible, we'll publish through uh, uh, snapshots on Twitter uh, to keep you updated. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That's absolutely brilliant um, and really quite obvious as to how much is, is going on. If there is anything that you want to ask any more questions about this evening, you know, like I say, don't forget uh, chat box on the right hand side, stick your questions in there and we will do our best to look through those at, at the end of the programme. Just to um, say again, Tom mentioned an awful lot of tools within within his talk. If these aren't linked in the chat box on the right hand side, there are some handouts there. Please head through to our web page. Otherwise, um, the tools are all on there also. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tom Dummett from RAGT. Um, who is going to talk a little bit further about their new variety that's that's come to fruition this time, um, the breeding materials that are uh, available and how they've tested strain presence within that. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks, Rose, and thanks, Tom. Um, what I'm going to do is just run through the background of um, the new genetics in RGT Wolverine, uh, how we got there in the first place, uh, and um, the tests we've done over the last couple of years, followed by the uh, variety itself. So just cracking into it, what we've got is, well, first of all, there's no known resistance in the current wheat genome. What we've had to do is use some work from the Commonwealth Research Organization in Australia that they did in um, the late 90s. Um, where they took some uh, genetic material from uh, a wild relative to wheat, Tinnopyrum intermedium. So what they did was they managed to back cross this into uh, a, wheat, uh, a wheat variety and this integration of DNA was um, this BDV2 segment. So BDV2 was the first uh, gene for BYDV resistance for wheat breeding. Um, the reason it's taken so long is because obviously you've got something that looks very different to a current wheat genome, uh, wheat, wheat variety in uh, a wheat grass here. Um, and then we had to get it into something that we could actually cross into a um, elite program. So we were able to do that by back crossing and back crossing, which you can see here. Um, first of all, into a spring wheat and then into an elite variety, which we could then put into a normal breeding program. So this on its own took 10 to 12 years. And then you've got to get this into a normal uh, wheat breeding program, which again, if you accelerate it, can be seven years, but anywhere between seven and 10 years. So that was the initial bit, and the, and the we knew that the um, the wheat gene, uh, the 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 BDV2 um, was resistant to uh, not just one virus but several viruses. So we needed to to work out what we actually had. So in RGT Wolverine, we did set out to ask ourselves some questions, and what Tom uh, suggested before is that. We haven't got resistance to aphids but to, or to the vectors, but we actually need to do some work to prove that. So what kind of resistance did we have here? Were we completely resistant to aphids, so therefore there's no feeding, therefore no virus transmitting, transmitting all the way through to whether it was a tolerant, tolerant variety where we had aphids feeding, virus was replicating, it showed symptoms, but uh, there was no yield drag or loss. 
The other thing that was extremely important in bringing this segment of DNA over was that it was the smallest segment possible. So the key to that was that because it was the smallest segment possible, we didn't have any yield drag or disease resistance problems or quality issues that might be of concern to, to farmers. So that was, that was key. So these are the sort of questions we had to ask and then anything from that in between. So whether it was aphids were feeding, but no virus, virus was getting in or whether the virus was getting in, but not replicating. So those are the sort of questions we had to ask. So we obviously had Wolverine, but what we also had was um, some near isogenic clines, which effectively were two varieties that were genetically identical, except one had the BDV2 resistance and one didn't. So you can take all the other environmental factors out and you were just purely looking at the BDV2 um, segment of DNA. So you were able to use them as, they're, they're basically perfect controls. Uh, and we did that along with Wolverine and the susceptible standard RL variety. First, um, first experiment was in a lab where we planted up the pots in a glass house. We brought in infected aphids with the most common strain in the UK PAV, PAV, and they were brushed on uh, at leaf two, incubated for around 42 days. And the important thing here is that there was no visual symptoms observed at all um, in that 42 days. So what we had to do, kind of like your COVID test, had to send them for, for ELISA testing. Um, so we we got those results got those results back and what we also did at this was um we did this lab experiment four times and every time we counted the amount of aphids within the individual pots uh, and these are the results we got so those um near isogenic lines that i that i mentioned um genetically identical but one had the bdv2 and one didn't you can see there was no difference in the amount of aphids at um, any of the uh, experiments we did there. And that was backed up by the standard RL variety and RGT Wolverine. So because that was the case, we could sort of park that. We knew we weren't resistant to, to the vectors. It wasn't a, an aphid resistance. But where we got quite excited was when we saw the um, virus replication within the the plant. So you can see the susceptible varieties uh, had 100% replication or 100% um, tested for um, the, the PAV virus where the resistant, there was a tenfold decrease between the, the susceptible and resistant, mil, uh, resistant mils. And that was backed up again by the standard RL variety and RGT Wolverine. So we knew we had something quite special in this, this genetics. So that was all well and good in controlled environment, but what we had to do is move it out to the field to see how it works in the real world. So similar experiments, but we had two susceptible varieties um, in as a standard RL variety, obviously Wolverine. And we also got some advanced populations, which were kind of like the nils, which were segregating for BYDV. Some had it and some didn't. Uh, we did it at three different locations, Ickleton, um, which is at, head office, RAGT, or not head office, but the UK base for RAGT, um, Bleasby in Lincolnshire and Haywell. So all of these sites were infected with aphids containing the PAV virus. And as soon as the pot experiments were done at um, Ickleton, those pots were planted out within this trial. So there was continued infection all the way through the season. This was 2019, I should add. So there is no current scoring method for BYDV, so we sort of had to uh, invent one where we went from uh, no symptoms, uh, which you can see clearly on the left here, all the way through to very severe symptoms with the classic reddening and yellowing of leaves and obvious stunting. And these are the results we got. So um, you can see at the site at Ickleton, we had no symptoms observed in RGT Wolverine at all. 
um, where the standard RL varieties saw between anything from a trace up to very obvious symptoms, but they averaged at around one and a half to two. And the same really was for Yorkshire uh, and Bleasby. And we were concerned maybe when we saw the first bit of Wolverine showing a trace symptom, but it was only ever a trace. And what we believe is happening is that um, where the aphids feeding, there's a slight bit of virus transmitted, but it's not replicating within the plant. So that's why we could maybe see a trace. But we'll come on to more of that when we get into 2020 results. And you can see here visually what that looks like. So you can see Wolverine as a variety on the left here, no symptoms at all. Early stages of BYDV starting to creep in into the BYDV susceptible variety, the standard RL. You can see it just starting to arc here, the yellowing and reddening. Here is some smaller plots. You've got Wolverine in the foreground here. In the background there, you can see classic red yellowing symptoms. So because we infected the trial with aphids containing the most common strain in the UK, PAV, we expected to see uh, levels of that virus within all of the all of the trial locations and that was quite evident when we tested it from the ELISA point of view but what was really interesting is that we didn't infect with the MAV and um, the RPV which um, come in at slightly different times I mean Tom will be able to answer that better than I will um, but we saw quite high, high levels of the MAV and RPV at, at Hayworld there but certainly we saw detections of it at every single site so what that told us is that we weren't just resistant to one strain, but we were resistant to multiple strains of BYDV with this BDV2 uh, gene that we have in RGT Wolverine. So going on to 2020, we developed a, another trial protocol where we did um, quite a bit more testing, uh, where we had three different sowings early, normal and late. And you can see we didn't quite get in as early as we wanted to with the early sowing, um, but we were 17th of September. So um, reasonably early still. Normal was the beginning of October and late was the middle of, of November. Um, what we did was we split the trial in half. So half the trial had a single insecticide spray and that was based on one of the tools that Tom talked about. Um, and half the trial had no insecticide. To make sure we got infection as well, we did multiple releases of aphids. We actually did eight releases of PAV infected aphids within these, these, these trials. So it was a fairly robust um, trial that we did with um, the BDV2 resistance this last season. Um, and again, we had a scoring method between zero and five, where you had five being very high symptoms, stunting throughout, um, real yellow and reddening of leaves um, through, to, through to that none or trace symptoms as a one or a zero. So fairly well tested this year, and these are the results we got. So this is the trial with no insecticide and you can see that it was a good trial and we got a lot of infection because of the amount of aphids that we were we released. And you can see there was uh, when we did these scoring time points, this was starting from the middle of April um, through to June. Um, and you can see clearly that the BDV2 material, including Wolverine, had virtually no symptoms. I mean, it was hard to tell whether there were symptoms or there was some slight droughting here. So there may be a little bit of, of noise around this, but the, the ones that clearly had BYDV there, it was very, very obvious. And if you come, if you can try and come to see this next year um, in Cambridgeshire, you'll see the difference. It really is chalk and cheese as to when you've got resistance and when you've got susceptibility. So that was the that was the early sown series with the insecticide, and this shows the stunting levels. And you can see there was no stunting whatsoever in the BDV2 material, 
even if we did see a tip that was um, maybe red or yellow, um, where nearly every other variety had significant levels of stunting that didn't have the BDB2 resistance. And this was it, the same graph on the bottom there, you can see, as you just saw previously, but the one above it was the single insecticide. So the insecticide was having an effect to Ickleton, um, but what it did what it did do was slow that infection down. So there was still quite high levels of infection in the end, but again, the BDV2 Wolverine material, um, very, very um, good and not showing any symptoms at all, really. Uh, and then this was the normal sowing. So we did an early, late, and a normal, sorry, an early normal and a late sowing. Every time we got a bit later, the symptoms reduced, and that was clear here. The late one had no symptoms at all. So the, the, as um, Adrian was saying in the, in, in the beginning, delayed drilling is, is one of the best tools still, and that was quite evident. We're not going to repeat the late one this year because that had no infection levels. So this is what we got on the normal sowing. And again, you can see the BDB2 material showing very little, if any, symptoms whatsoever. Uh, and when we you see a bar pop up here, it's maybe one plant with the odd leaf that's got a um, red or yellow stripe in it, so or leaf in it, um, but it's not replicating within that. So, and then with the yield performance from the early sowing, so every variety, bizarrely other than Santiago, had a negative yield impact um, when we had a no insecticide. Um, and we had a yield impact up to around 18% on some varieties where the BDV2 material had no yield impact um, when the difference between um, no insecticide and a single insecticide to show that that resistance really is really is working. So that's a bit of a background to the genetics. Um, so now I'll go on to the variety itself. So the reason we were so excited about Wolverine and the, the material coming after Wolverine is that, as I said before, there was no negative yield drag, disease profile or disease resistance issues um, or quality issues with that segment of DNA being back crossed into the, into the wheat. Um, so you can see here the last five years in trial, We've got Wolverine up against Santiago and Skyfall. The reason those varieties are there, I know they're older now, but they were they were the highest shielding varieties in 2015. And you can see where they've started to drop off. Wolverines remain very, very high yielding every single year it's been in our internal trials. This is at 43 different trial sites, so a lot of trials. When you move on to the more current material, um, there wasn't a lot of seed around of Wolverine last year for trials, but Agri had it in four locations, and at those four locations, Mean of Kent, um, Hampshire, Wales, and Essex, um, you can see that Wolverine was the highest yielding variety in trial, even in the absence of BYDV. Um, so it has very high yield potential as a variety, even without BDB2 or BYDB. And then AHDB data, of course. Um, this is the AHDB two-year data, and it was yielding 102% of controls. You'll see this on the candidate list. Um, very consistent in every single region, it, it was 102%. Quality and disease-wise, um, very good spec weight, high untreated, high treated yield, sorry, decent for mildew, maturity is reasonably early at a plus one, very stiff variety, should point out that is a percentage lodging, not a score. Tritter size and average tritter size at 5.5. Yellow rust would be a seven, but if we're honest, this year it's going to probably be a good five, a poor six. We have seen a bit more yellow rust come into it this year, so it probably won't remain a seven. It's probably going to be a good five, um, which is still a manageable level. And that, I believe, is it from me. Uh, as Adrian said, there is a limited amount of seed available this 
season. Um, we planted as much as we possibly could, um, but with the weather that prevailed, seed rates had to go up because drilling got later um, and there wasn't quite as much as we'd hoped. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, really quite interesting um, and good plug for seed at the end of that. Uh, if I could ask you all to switch your cameras back on, um, we're going to have a look at some of the questions during this discussion. If, if anybody has any further points um, or anything that they do want to ask about, you know, mentioned already, but please put your questions in the box on the right hand side and we'll do our best to get through them. I am aware that um, it's eight o'clock. I did pre-warn you that my time management skills aren't always the greatest. So if any of you do have to dash off, um, like I say, this session has been recorded and if it doesn't come through on your email tomorrow, which I'm sure it will, it will be available online, either the YouTube channel or the AHDB website. Um, first of all, though, I'd just like to ask Adrian um, to take centre stage first. Uh, and having heard about BYDV implications on, on your farm and the new techniques um, that we've heard from Tom and, and Tom that that could be available um, and and are, are available. What are your thoughts going forwards? Um, I mean, I think the long-term solution is through plant breeding. You know, we know that there's a, it's getting very difficult to get new insecticides, chem, you know, ag chem products registered. Um, the ones we've got are under threat. And that's, to me, that's only gonna continue. So I think you know, resistant varieties or tolerant varieties, whichever way you want to look at it, is, is going to be the way forward. Um, yes, we can manage things with drilling date, we can think about that, but we're just increasing our risk with the weather. Brilliant, thank you very much. So if we get kicked off with some of the questions, um, Adrian, as, as we go through these, if you've got any thoughts or practicalities um, or realistic expectations of how this would work on farm, then do, by all means, um, stick your oar in and, and tell us what you think. Um, but to start with, Lee McLean has, has asked, do trap crops and flowering strips work be better in spring crops than autumn, or are there species that flower in late autumn? Tom, I think that's for you, but we're both Tom, so. <laughs> and I think you're on mute as well, Tom. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no, right. it's, it's, a good, it's a good point. And I think it's something that if, if uh, what we're proposing in this project um, uh, shows promise that uh, we can effectively uh, trap the aphids uh, uh, in the way that we're proposing, then to begin with, we're going to be using standard um, uh, flowering strips, but it may well be something that we want to adapt because you're quite right that in that question but we tend to think about these flowering strips as spring into early summer is, is when they're, they're primarily uh, you know targeting but here we're looking for slightly later in the year so um, yes there would be varieties and um, that we could uh, oh, sorry um, plant species that you could add into that mix uh, that would be useful but I think the first step is to can we get this trap trap crop working and then adjust the flowering strip to to maximize its utility uh, uh, for later in the season when that would be of most use. But Adrian, do you are working with anything like that at home at all? No, we haven't. Uh, it's just practical, really. Um, you know, it's, it, and it's the same argument with trap crops for for flea beetle and rape. You know, it just we're all under pressure to get crops drilled. Um, it just means more men, more machine, more problems when the weather isn't generally very helpful. Um, if we could do maybe track crops that would, you know, we went maybe you know a drill width every hundred meters up the field, then that might be practical. But I'm sure that's not going to be close enough together to, to have any effect on the on the uh, aphids. Thank you, Eric Anderson's asking um, Tom again. I think this is for you. Are visual cues for aphids less important than all factory cues? It's a good, good question. So but both are important. Uh, it very much depends on the um, the distance um, uh, that the uh, the aphids are from the from the plant. So at distance, uh, then visual cues may be more important. But as the aphids get closer to the plants and they're making a decision whether to land or not, then 
the uh, the general um, accepted wisdom on this is that uh, uh, the the smell, the olfactory cues, are more important than the the visual cues. But it's it's something we're going to be looking at in this this new project to just confirm that 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 is in, indeed the case. And so we will be looking looking at that. And while you're still there, <laughs> what's um, the shape of the yield loss first time of infection graph? Is it a straight line or more dramatic drop off as crops get closer to growth stage 30 than 31? Yeah, it's it's um, probably more of more of a, a curve. So the closer, I mean, Tom may may have some some thoughts on this as well. But the closer the the plants get to growth stage 31, the um, the less affected they're going to be. Uh, um, so. Um, there's a sort of um, uh, you you get to a, a point where a growth stage 31 where you're not you're not having um, a yield loss that will cause you um, you know a financial concern like it would earlier uh, earlier in the crops establishment. So I, I describe it more as a curve as you you approach growth stage 31. And Tom Dummett, um this could be more one for you. Could Mary's Huntsman's susceptibility to aphids be due to the lack of a semi-dwarfing gene? Um, I I actually wouldn't know the answer to that, if I'm honest. Um, I don't know whether Tom would know know that better than I would. I I, I don't. I mean, it, it's my, Maris Huntsman came out of a breeding program for rust resistance, if if I understand correctly. Um, and it was a particular breeding program that seems to have been rather unique. And then when it was ended, um, uh, the plant breeding took a slightly different different route. Um, so good question. I don't know the answer, though, for sure. I'm sure we'll be able to um, find out. John Yules is asking, you said grain aphid populations contain resistant individuals and bird cherry may contain tolerant individuals. Can you explain, is this target site or enhanced metabolism re resistance and will there be any advantages in implying a higher rate of pyrethroid insecticide? By that I mean double, triple, etc. rate to maintain control. Okay, so for the, the grain aphid, um, it's target site resistance. Um, but interestingly, for the, the grain aphid, um, it seems to be um, a heterozygote for a heterozygous form of um, uh, target site resistance, which means that it's not um, as highly resistant as it might be if it had uh, two copies of a resistance gene. Uh, so it's not a metabolic resistance, it's tar target site resistance. Um, that means at the moment that a correctly timed full rate application of a pyrethroid should still be effective against the uh, uh, the grain aphid. But you can see where this is going, that they will likely develop them um, a higher level of resistance, in which case um, they'll be fully resistant to um, pyrethroids uh, and then a, a higher concentration, double, triple, won't make a great deal of difference but what it will do is wipe out your natural enemies so i would uh, i it's probably not a route we want to to go down but um uh, with target site resistance it confers such a high level of resistance that um it, it largely makes the insecticide that class of insecticide not useful going forward at the moment we're kind of on the borderline but um uh, should they get both both uh, copies of resistance then uh, then that would be game over for peripheries against grain aphids Sure, surely if we go <coughs> increase the rate of insecticide, all we're going to do is increase the speed of resistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's not, it, it, we're chasing our tail if you if you go down that route. It's not, um, we, we and, and, and it's not the fault of pyrethroids uh, largely, we, we've ended up that they are the only only insecticide option. So they, they become the default uh, uh, insecticide to use in this instance and and other instances, which means you're just driving resistance, as Adrian says. With this in mind, Adrian, have you seen your spray program change much recently? Um, I wouldn't say it has. Like I said, you know, I'm very reluctant to use insecticide, and, and they really, really are a tool of last resort for me. Um, we haven't sprayed. Since 2016, we haven't actually sprayed a field of cereals with an with an insecticide in the autumn, or in, or or any other time of year. Um, you know, it's just something we try to avoid because you know I'm a big believer that if you allow the natural predators to build up, they will control the problem. 
but all the time you, you kill them off, you can't expect them to control the problem. Thank you. Just following on the theme of sprays, um, Tom Dummett, George Hoyes is asking, uh, in your trials on the late drilled wheat, you still applied an insecticide in the middle of April. At what point has wheat grown beyond the point of susceptibility? Well, I think that goes back to Tom's point about um, the growth stage and that curve, doesn't it? So, um, I don't know when uh, a variety or a wheat becomes um, less susceptible in its growth stage to BYDV. Um, why we did that was based on the aphid uh, monitoring system, um, and that's when we were advised to spray. Um, and we had to keep that control through. So we did an early and a, a medium drilling, as I said, and that spray timing based on the tool was whatever date it was, I can't remember now. And then the same applied to that late sowing um, system as well. So that's why we did it when we did it. And we're always looking at developing that protocol. So like I said, we've got no infection in the late sown anyway. So it probably wasn't worth spraying. And we've dropped that all together now for for this next season coming because we didn't get any infection so the later drilling did control it anyway so then going forwards um do you think it will be possible to introduce the bdv2 gene into all new ragt varieties in the future and that's a question from andrew wilkins that would be a great scenario we will we're not just looking at BDV2, we're looking at other sources of resistance as well. So if we can start stacking stacking genes as well, that'd be great. Um, not all of the material come through with it because you obviously got um, different categories of wheat as well in terms of bread making biscuit. If we get it into everything, that's great. But like I said, it's taken 20 years to get to where we are with a feed wheat at the minute. We've got lines in um, that we'll be entering into NL1 this year with BYDV. We've got lines um, behind that with quality and midge resistance coming through. So there is a production line of these new varieties from our AGT. Not all of our varieties will have it because we'll have other disease resistances coming in um, with different genes and that sort of thing. So that would be the ideal scenario, but it won't be every single variety. Um, as Simon Berry is asking, uh, the BVD2 varieties, isn't this a tolerance um, and has the BDD, it's a mouthful to get out, BDV2 gene already broken down in Eastern Europe? Uh, not that I'm aware of because I'm pretty sure this is the first commercialised variety in Europe with BDV2, so I find that hard to believe. Um, there was some work done in a glass house where they tried to break things a long time ago. I don't know where that was, um, but there's no other commercialised BDV2 variety within Europe. There is other material in the States, in Australia and New Zealand. They've all been working um, for the last, well, since 2004, I think it was. They've had material which is BDV2 resistant and they're still BDV2 resistant today. So not that I'm aware of there's any resistance breaking down. I mean, and anything's just, possible sorry. because it's a biological system at the end of the day, but there's no evidence that we've seen it's breaking down. Uh, and just following on from that, Mike Jess was asking, do other breeders have this type of resistance in their programmes? Do you? Uh, I'm sure they'll be trying to. Are you to. aware of? <laughs> I'm sure they'll be trying um, to. There's been a few questions about the price of seed and royalties. Contact your local merchant. Is that the right answer? <laughs> yeah, there is a slightly different royalty system with BYD, the, the BYDV varieties. They're going through the BIPO system, so the royalty won't be included on the seed you buy. It will be on a area payment through the BIPO system. There's peas, beans, oats, and obviously Ray already through that system. So you're there'll be some farmers that are used to that system or growers. And then just one last question to finish with, um, conscious of, of time, as I've mentioned, but is there any work on the correlation between potassium levels in crops and aphid pressure? 
I want I, to stump you all right at the very yeah. end. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's a good one. Uh, I, I don't know a genuine answer, um, possibly, but not, not some work that I've come across. So I, I, I'd have a look, but uh, can't give you an immediate answer. No, nor can I, my friend. No, well, that was from Ian Matt, so we'll do our best to um, follow that that up, Ian, but you've stumped them all for the end of the evening. Um, Adrian, just before I close, I don't know if you've got any thoughts, uh, further thoughts as to sort of what's being discussed this evening at all? No, um, you know, I think the, the question about the potassium levels is probably quite interesting. I'm not sure what a, the, the, you know, Ian's asking that from the point of view of, well, you know, is it a, is it a smell from a potassium rich plant that puts the aphids off or does it increase the, you know the plant's resistance to infection i don't know it'd be interesting to know what he was thinking to make him ask the question thank you um right well we'll, we'll close those questions then um thank you all very much for your in, input there and we'll get tied up um and let you all retire for your well-deserved gin and tonic We've mentioned already throughout this webinar um, resources that are available. There are some handouts attached to this to this webinar, um, but please do have a look at our website. The toolkits are there, um, and as as well as the Sears and All Seeds recommended list, um, great soils, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So please do have a look through there. And like I say, the webinars that are all pre-recorded, uh, sorry, are recorded and will be available online. Um, so just to finish, just a couple of things to mention um, for those of us that are hoping to attend Crop Tech this year, come what may, I am going. Um, I'm fit to see people and, and get out of this house as wonderful as it is. Um, but there are webinars planned over these days, um, cost management at, at Crop Tech, so three dates, and this will be exploring a range of topics, including cereals and oil seeds agronomy, machinery buildings, and diversification. And following that, we also have, if you want to slide on one, Christian, um, the AHTB Agronomy Week. All these events are available online, um, AHTB forward slash events. So please have a look there if, if you miss if you miss these but um, Monday the 30th of November through to Friday the 4th of December we've got daily webinars um, focusing on varieties soils pests water etc etc so again lots of information available and and coming forwards um, so if we go on one more just to finish with um, there will be a survey comes through afterwards following this webinar. If you could fill that in, it would be really appreciated. The digital platform, whether we like it or not, is certainly going to be part of our of our future. Um, and we've all had to learn to use them. And I think officially we can write this on our CV now as, a, as another skill. I've mentioned already that this session has been recorded. Um, and if there's any questions that anybody has, please feel free to get in touch with me and I'll do my best to answer them. But don't forget basis and Neroso points. Um, if you miss putting them in the chat box on the right hand side, do send them send them through to me. So without further ado, Tom, Tom, Adrian, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, it's been a, a whirlwind tour of, of BYDV uh, and there certainly is without a doubt an awful lot to think about and an awful lot of work going into this um, and it's going to be certainly part of the IPM strategy to be watched going forwards. Um, so thank you all very much and um, look forward to seeing you soon. Good night everybody.